This is the sermon for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost in 2015. It also happens to be the first of our mobile from the road, or more accurately, from the waterway sermons. In uh, preaching a sermon, by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I owe a rather extreme debt of intellectual gratitude to the fine exegetical work done by Reverend Paul Neuchterlein. We're recording today in the gracious home of Reconciliation Ministries elder Albert Daly and his wife Joan, who have been so kind as to allow us to stay here while we uh, prepare the sailing vessel Artful Dodger for the trip to the east coast of Florida. Uh, of course, we imagine that we'd be about two-thirds of the way to Florida by now, uh, but sometimes our plans and expectations require adjustment. Even before being in the water, this trip has taught me any number of lessons, not the least of which has to do with patience. This morning, we'll be looking at the appointed gospel lesson, which is taken from the gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter, beginning with verses 34 and 35, and continuing on to verses 41 through 51. The text is as follows. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on a lost day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. In recent years, my addressing of this text has focused primarily on the scandalous nature of what Jesus was saying. People wondered what he was talking about. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Is he suggesting some peculiar cannibalistic practice? And I've suggested that at the very core of Jesus' teaching, he was in fact intimating a kind of cannibalism, strange as that may seem, that in its very essence, the Eucharist is cannibalistic. As we celebrate the Eucharist, we are in fact recalling that our darkest nature is in fact exactly that of a cannibal. In our so-called fallen natures, we do cannibalize one another, perhaps not literally, but yet as human beings, we tend to live off the life of other human beings. So as Jesus offered his very life on the cross, betrayed into the hands of the violent, yet utterly without violence himself, he demonstrates simultaneously how bad we can be and how ultimately good his Abba and our Abba is. Thus, the Eucharist derives its power by reminding us that we are, from the greatest of us to the least of us, united in what we have been. We acknowledge, as it were, the blood in our hands. But then we are also united by God's forgiveness and love poured out for all people. Finally, we are united by what God calls us to be and transforms us into bringers of peace and light 
into the world that he is remaking. This morning, though, I'd like to look a little further into the text, particularly into the meaning of the phrase, uh, bread of life. What exactly is this uh, bread of life? Our text offers us a few clues. Verse 33, antecedent to our text, states, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34 goes on to say that Jesus declared that he was the bread of life. No meek claim there. And again in verse 48, Jesus says, that he is the bread of life, and then goes on in subsequent verses to contrast the bread of life with the bread that the children of Israel received at the hand of Moses in the desert, the bread which they called manna. So again, all of this begs the question, what precisely is this bread of life? Uh, Now some may answer, oh, it says right there, Jesus is the bread of life. And one might even further conclude, he's telling them about Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And unless you receive the Eucharist, his body and blood, you're not going to have eternal life. Simple. Yet, having already addressed at some length and touched briefly upon, as we began, the deeply important symbolism of the Eucharist, I'd like to suggest There's something even more immediate and elemental in Jesus' statements. For at this time, the time when Jesus was making these particular statements, no Eucharistic rite had been established. No one had yet determined that the Lord's Supper was an essential sacrament of the Church, for in fact the disciples had not yet celebrated what we think of as the Lord's Supper. Here today, we read about Jesus standing there teaching. Interestingly enough, not long after feeding an enormous crowd with bread and fish, and now he is saying that he is the bread of life. And we must take this bread into ourselves. It really doesn't matter how we try to define the metaphor. We're still left with a question. What does it mean, then, to take this bread to take Jesus into ourselves. At the risk of being a little bit speculative, and perhaps offending my junior high school English teacher, who sternly warned me against defining things by what they are not, I'd like to propose that we might understand the bread of life a little more clearly if we thought there were also a bread of death. We understood what that meant. Jesus stops just short of calling the manna in the desert bread of death, though he doesn't pull any punches when he said that their forefathers ate manna in the desert and eventually died. Jesus' enticing statement to the people, whoever eats of the bread that I give will never be hungry again, is analogous to his statement to the woman at the well, if you drink of the water that I will give you, you will never be thirsty again. In both cases, the woman and the crowds responded, This, sir, is what we want. Please give this to us. But this bread of death that I postulate, the bread that the world eats when it does not eat the bread, nor drink of the water of life. I remember at an early age, Uh, probably somewhere in elementary school, learning the word consumer. Consumer, it turned out, was almost analogous to citizen. We are all, by that definition I learned, consumers. We quite literally consume things. We not only use things, but we use them up. We eat, of course. All life survives on other life, a wise man once pointed out. We eat fruits and vegetables and animals. We consume them. And even resources and so-called durable goods, we use them up. It's the nature of things. So far, I suppose it's not all that deathly, 
unless, of course, you're one of the things being used up. But it isn't just that we use things and even use them up. It's that we never reach a point of satisfaction. We are never really sated. Long before we have worn out our clothing or our shoes, our automobiles or our homes, we find ourselves craving more or better. It is, in fact, what society teaches, uh, subtly and sometimes not so subtly, to acquire more, to have better, uh, specifically better than your neighbors or better than your parents had, or at least better than you had before, and no sooner to achieve our desires than the craving kicks in again. And again, we might say this is not so bad. Uh, some might even call it necessary. Uh, not long ago I was uh, chided, not for the first time, for the aged vehicle I drive. You have to get rid of that car. Why? I asked. Because it's so old, was the response. But it runs fine, and when something does break, I fix it. So why should I get another one? Because if everyone were like you, driving 20-year-old cars, the economy would come to a grinding halt. Now, actually, that is a point, well taken. And there are parts of the world where to maintain old appliances and electronics and other gadgets is considered unpatriotic. But it's not just a matter of keeping the economy going or not going, not just a matter of having something newer or presumably better, it is the deathly part. It is the inevitable dissatisfaction and discouragement that the rampant consumerism that we appear to be addicted to leads, that makes our life of consumption and the things we consume, a kind of bread of death. We compare ourselves to others, and either we find that we come up lacking, for they have more than us, their possessions are nicer or newer, or else they are smarter, more attractive, we become envious, bitter, even hateful. Or we compare and we realize, oh, I am better than at least that person, or those people over there, and we cozy up in the comfortable seat of arrogance. Perhaps this type of comparison is a little nibble from the tree of knowledge of good and evil from mythical Eden. I'm good, they're evil, or they're good and I am evil. Their life is good or has more good than the evil in my life. And eating even a little from that fruit, as promised, brings nothing but a living death. Regardless of where we stand, almost always the proverbial bread this world offers brings no satisfaction. If we have little, we crave more. If we achieve more, we begin to worry others will take it from us. And then we need even more resources in order to protect what we already have. Like an addict, the more we have, the more we crave. While the ubiquitous law of diminishing satisfaction slaps us in the face. But it's not just on a personal level that we eat of this worldly bread of death, for even the most reclusive individual remains on some level a part of the human cosmos, the structures humankind establishes. And not only are we all a part of it, but we contribute to it. We make the structure, each of us, millimeter by millimeter, until we are all embedded in it. Our structures, our corporations, our nations, are they not created in our own image? Do they too not crave more and more? Not satisfied with the current profit margin, the corporation exports jobs to places where there are no minimum wage regulations. Not satisfied with the abundance of resources already possessed, nations find ways to appropriate the resources of other nations. It seems the nations are as much addicted to having more and more 
as are the consumers that populate those nations. Inevitably, all of this leads to violence. Sometimes, violence of the exploitative kind. Workers with little or no meaningful recompense for their labor. Major swaths of the world's population that live without even basic resources and necessities. And ultimately, it leads to violence of the overt kind. War and uprising. Terrorism and counterterrorism. It seems we as individuals and as a family of nations are as addicted to violence as much as anything else. We can't get enough of it, or so it seems. An outside observer to our human race might say that like an addict, we live for our fix of violence, a violence which we need in greater and greater doses. Of course, few would admit that we love war and violence as a people. In fact, we would, most of us, claim to repudiate violence. Yet, look at what we do as a species. Look even at what most entertains us, what makes the headlines, what makes for the deepest and most urgent conversations. There is only one place that any of this leads, this being our insatiable cravings for more, our envy, our bitterness, our love of supposedly righteous violence based on, and there it is again, our belief that we can adjudicate between the good and the evil people. All of that, the bread that the world gives, leads only to death. Long before it leads to the physical death of individuals and the societal death of nations, it causes spiritual death, soul death, psychological death, emotional death, consuming the bread of death. To that, Jesus offers an antidote, a radical alternative. That would be the bread of life. Verse 45 of our text says that Jesus reminded the grumbling pundits they will all be taught by God. And God, it seems, teaches by example, by demonstration. Uh, perhaps the very bread of life, the Christ whom we take into ourselves, is in fact forgiveness. Forgiveness born of God's love for all of God's children. Forgiveness that some equate with grace. Jesus forgave even his own murderers. He forgave his accusers. He forgave the friends who betrayed and disowned him out of fear. It is, I believe, forgiveness that can neutralize the poison found in the world's bread of death. Forgiveness that can and will ultimately bring an end to the seemingly immutable cycle of violence. Forgiveness that will quell our otherwise insatiable urges. If we as individuals forgive the slights bandied our way, if we manage to forgive others who have more than us, or forgive those we see as less than us, if we can forgive even a world that we believe has treated us unfairly, how much freer we will become to experience the life that our Abba has already made for us. What if, just imagine, if nations forgave each other, let go of age-old grudges and prejudices? What if the so-called races forgave each other? What if the religions forgave each other? What manner of life would we find? How then we might find ourselves feasting on the bread of life, never to be hungry or thirsty again. Oh, pastor, you're such a dreamer. That'll never happen. And what can I do? Just one lone person. Besides, what you say is so hard to do. I bet you can't do it, nor anyone else. And I would respond that it is hard. Especially at first, I have it under pretty good advice that birth, childbirth that is, 
is difficult. It's difficult for the mother and for the child. Rebirth might be no different, and it takes time. But as I have said so many times before, each time you take a step, each time you shun that judgmental fruit from the tree of death, each time you say a word of kindness, where you could just as easily have said a word of harshness, each time you put aside jealousy and envy, comparison, each time you give instead of take, each time, in fact, you find satisfaction in the blessings your Father in Heaven has bestowed upon you, and what's more, endeavor to share those blessings, you are, I believe, eating another crumb, another little crust of the bread of life. You are, in fact, aspiring to be a part of Christ's body, to build his kingdom. Go, then, be a seeker of peace, a maker of peace. Strive to bring light where there is darkness. Overcome evil with good. Thank you.